Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of images of people with masks and without masks. Uh, and we're going to try to classify images uh, with masks and without. So, in here we have a train and, and test directory, some images with masks and some without. Um, and yeah, we're going to use TensorFlow, Keras, Convolutional Neural Network uh, to make the predictions and then we'll visualize some of the results using PyPlot. So let's hop into the notebook. Um, I'm just using four imports today. Uh, NumPy, Pandas, actually I don't think we even need Pandas, so three imports. Might as well put them on one line. NumPy, PyPlot, and TensorFlow. So run that. Uh, and the first thing to do is to get the directories to our trained and test sets. So I'm just going to go and grab, uh, we're not using masks 2.0, we're using this mask data. So we'll grab the train folder, and let's call this trainder. Uh, and then we'll have the tester as well. That's the same thing, but test on the end. Okay, so once we have that, we can load in the images. Uh, so our train and test set are already pre-split for us. Um, so using flow from directory in this case is probably our best bet. Uh, it's a very simple and nice easy way to do it. It'll automatically infer the class names from the image uh, from the folders that the images are in. So we're going to create two image data generators if we want to flow from the directories. Uh, so we'll call it train generator and test generator and they're both going to be tf.keras.preprocessing dot image dot image data generator like that uh, so in here we can specify any transforms we want to apply to the images before they're pulled into the environment uh, for example we can maybe horizontally flip the images with horizontal flip uh, equals true uh, this will be applied randomly to a subset of the data um, so it won't generate new images if you use it in this current in this way uh, I'm not going to do any um, augmentation today, just uh, but there's 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 a whole list of different augmentations you can do. You can adjust the brightness, you can rotate the image, flip it horizontally, vertically, um, zoom in on it, shift it in any direction, uh, and some others. But I'm not going to do this just because. Well, it does increase training time by a little bit, um, and I'm not going to. I mean, it's just not so essential. Uh, we'll still, you'll see, we'll get pretty good results with this model. Um, however, there is one transform I want to apply, which is a rescale. Now, I don't have to do this here. Um, I could put a layer in my model that will rescale the images for us. Um, by rescale, I mean, uh, let's change the, va the actual pixel values, the numeric values. Uh, instead of being on a range from 0 to 255 of color intensity, let's switch it to a range of 0 to 1, because uh, that will work a lot better for the model. So we're going to divide every pixel value by 255 to, to accomplish that, uh, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over 255. So we'll rescale by a factor of 1 over 255. Um, and we'll do the same thing for our test generator. Um, so they're both the same. However, the train generator, um, the train generator is going to be shuffled when we flow. We're going to shuffle the images, but the test generator we're not going to shuffle uh, because we want to keep the test set intact when we evaluate it. And the train set, um, we want it randomized every time. Uh, we're also going to get some validation uh, data from the train generator. So I'm going to include a validation split here. And it will be 20%. So 20% of the train generator's image images will go to the validation set. The other 80% will go to the train set. So now let's uh, get the images using flow from uh, directory. So this doesn't actually load the images into the environment, but it specifies how they will be loaded in. And the reason we use a generator is so that we don't run out of memory uh, when we're training. Because if we tried to load all of the images from disk, we'd run out of memory very quickly. So the generator allows us to load them in a batch at a time, train on them, and then recycle the memory again. So we're going to get the trained images from train generator dot flow from directory so th this is specifying how we're going to pull the images which directory are we taking them from first which here will be trainder then uh, 
do we want to resize the images? So we have the option to resize them here with target size. And we want all the images to be of the same size. We don't want them too high resolution that it's going to take the model a really long time to train. We also don't want them too low resolution that we lose a lot of the information in the images. So something like in the 200 range is good. 224 by 224 is a pretty um, conventional example uh, for our target size. Color mode uh, will specify how um, how many channels the image has. So this is an RGB. These are RGB images with three color channels. So RGB. Then we'll specify the class mode. Uh, we only have two classes, so this is going to be binary. And then our batch size. So uh, we can specify a batch size here, and we'll load it in in batches. Therefore, we don't have to specify it later when we're training the model. So we'll give a batch size of 32. And then I want to include shuffle equals true, um, since this is the train set. We'll also set a random seed so that we can reproduce the shuffle. And we'll include this uh, argument subset. So a subset can either be training or validation. And this will use the validation split to identify which uh, of the data, which part of the train generator is going to this. So as long as the seed is the same, it'll always be the same split. So let's do the same thing for validation images. We'll call it val images. The only thing different here is that uh, is validation. So these are bo both using the same generator to pull from the same directory but the only difference is we're taking 80% of the data here and the other 20% over here. Last, we'll do the test images. Test images are a little different. Here we're going to use the test generator, uh, and we're going to uh, specify that we're pulling from test to dir. Now, the subset is not needed, and the seed isn't needed, because we're not shuffling for this. Shuffle equals false. All right, there are our uh, images. You can see the train set, the validation set, and the test set. And there's two classes in each. So now let's build the model. So we have images of size 224 by 224 by 3 coming in. And the 3 comes from the RGB channels. So our inputs, it's going to be tf.keras.input, where the shape is a vector of size 224 by 224 by 3, uh, or I should say a matrix. Okay, so um, now we're going to do a convolutional neural network. So the way this works is we have this little window of weights that traverses over the image and uh, convolves through the image. So it's, it's doing multiplication um, operations, multiplication and addition operations for each window. Uh, time step, and then sending that over to a new uh, set of features. Um, so it's sort of, you can think of it as extracting out um, features that are a, uh, a sort of a um, com combination of pixels in a region. So once we go through all of the, the convolutions, we can hope that we have extracted a new set of features uh, that's more um, that are more informative on their own than the original pixel features were. So let's do this. We're going to create tf.keras.layers.conv2d. This is our two-dimensional convolutional layer, and the filters is specifying how many times are we passing over the image. Uh, we're going to do a full pass over the image. And each time we make that full pass, we're going to create this new filter, or this new uh, two-dimensional uh, feature. And uh, how many of those two-dimensional features do we want to generate? So how many times are we making the full pass over the image? Uh, and we will be using different weights each time. So we'll get different features each time. Uh, so let's start with 32. Might as well. Maybe we could do 16. I don't know. We have 224 by 224, so this is a decent number, I think. It's, it's really up to you, and you can definitely experiment with it. Uh, then we specify the kernel size. So this is the window size. Um, how big of a window are we passing over? Also, how, how many weights do we have? So as this goes up, we get more weights. Um, as this goes up, we also get more weights. But 
Um, let's make a 3x3, three three, which is pretty standard. Our activation function will be ReLU at the end of the convolution. We'll pass in inputs. So I'm going to copy this over and we'll do another one of these with 64 filters. So it's, it's standard to progressively increase the filter size as you go. And you can think of that as um, taking, starting off by extracting low level features, maybe like lines or curves, and then uh, using those lines and curves to extract higher level features by putting them together in some way. That's not necessarily what the model is doing, but that's one way that you might be able to think about it. Okay, so after each convolutional layer, um, we want to pool the uh, results just to reduce the dimension, and I believe it introduces uh, nonlinearities to the data. Um, so tf.keros.layers.maxpool2d, pass in x, x, uh, this will max pool the, uh, so basically it also sends a, a window over just taking the max of each pixel um, to reduce the dimension. Alright, then once we have this, uh, if I run this and we look at x, you can see at the end here uh, we now have a 54 by 54 window with 64 features generated from here. Uh, so it's 64 two-dimensional features, right? So each of these 54 by 54 features um, hopefully is some sort of uh, visual feature, some image feature that can be useful for making predictions. So um, we do want it as a one-dimensional vector if we're going to use dense layers to make our predictions. Um, so we can do that in two ways. One, we could flatten it with tf.keras.layers.flatten on x, and that would flatten it all out to create a, a new vector of all those, so that that would be 54 uh, times 54 times 64. And that's what we get here. Um, however, this does, is probably too many features, we don't need it, so a nicer way to do it is with the global average pooling layer. Uh, but you can definitely try out each one uh, to see which does better. A global average pooling 2D, this instead will average across the first two dimensions so that we just have a single 64 dimensional uh, vector. Alright, so let's put that one in. Call that X. And then we're going to perform the classification. So now we have these 64 features. Um, I wonder if maybe we should, let's try flattening. Try flattening. So we have a bunch of features, this many features. And we're now going to use this new set of features to, no, I want to do the global average pooling. Okay, the only issue with this is that uh, we have only 64 features, so I'm wondering if we're able to capture enough information with this. If we wanted to change this, we could up this, to maybe 128, and then we get 128 features. I think we'll be okay though. Um, so we have 64 features and now we do the classifications. So now we just treat it like a proper classification task with uh, dense layers. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I, we could try this with 32, 32 uh, neurons, a ReLU activation. And then grab that. We'll maybe do another one of 32 as well. And then we will send the outputs, uh, send that to the outputs, which will be a dense layer with only one value. And that's going to be the probability of the positive class. So the activation here is sigmoid to give us a value between 0 and 1. And we'll pass in x. OK, so this should be our model. Uh, tf.keras.model. We specify the inputs as inputs and the outputs as outputs. Okay. So let's look at that model.summary. So we come in with the 224 by 224 by 3 image. Um, it goes through the convolutions, and the two pixels are taken off each side because the window. Um, it it doesn't go off the image, it, so it loses a pixel on each side since we're using a 3x3 three three, uh, kernel. 
then uh, it gets max pooled down in dimension. Then that new image, you can think of it as an image, it's really just a, a, a tensor of 2 by 2, by th uh, well, uh, sorry, 111 by 111 by 32. It's a three dimensional tensor. Uh, the first two dimensions are then actually the, the whole thing is convolved uh, again for convolved through with a convolutional uh, layer and again we lose two pixels on each side because of the window and then that gets max pooled down into 54 and then these two dimensions get averaged across into a single uh, 64 long vector then these are our new features that hopefully capture information about whether there's a mask in the image then these features are used to make our final predictions in the typical dense classification. So now let's compile the model. Uh, so we'll use an atom optimizer. For loss, we're going to use binary cross entropy. Um, and metrics, I guess we'll just use accuracy. All right, and then we'll fit the model. So I'll store the results in history in case we want to use that model.fit. So we're training on train images. And our validation data is going to be val images. And we don't have to specify a batch size because uh, we already did that with the generator. So we just specify the number of epochs to train for. Let's make it big and we'll use an early stopping callback. So callbacks equals tf.keras.callbacks.early stopping. Uh, and we'll monitor the validation loss with a patient's value of 3. Uh, let's make it 5. And restore the weights from the best epoch. So what this means is uh, we'll be looking at the validation loss and when it stops improving after 5 epochs, the model will stop training uh, and restore the weights from the best epoch. Oh, and actually, uh, I do want to train this with GPU acceleration because we are working with image classification. When you're working with image data, it's used, uh, it speeds it up a lot. Uh, so yeah, I'll resume this when it finishes training. All right, the training completed, and it looks like we're doing very well with an accuracy of around 95%. So let's see how we do on the test set. So I'll get the results back with model.evaluate, uh, and I'm passing in the test images I'm also going to set verbose equals zero so we don't see the loading bar. And we'll print out the loss. Uh, we'll display it to five decimal places. And that we'll get from result sub zero. So the first element of results will be the loss. The second element will be the accuracy. So let's display the accuracy down here. Since this is a percentage, I'll display this one to three decimal places with a percent sign and then multiply it by 100. And that's going to be result sub one. All right, um, so we're doing quite well, 92% accuracy. Uh, let me just indent this They're next to each other. And last thing we'll do is visualize some of the results. So we can see what the models, how the model's making classifications. Um, what I'm gonna do is grab the test generator. Um, I'm gonna create a new generator. This one's going to be called Sample Generator. And this is still going to use the test set, but I'm going to shuffle it so that we don't get, uh, so that we don't need to worry about the order. So this we'll call Sample Images, and that will come from Sample Generator. Now we'll still be taking from Tester, but Shuffle is going to be true. And we'll set the seed again. All right, so we are pulling in new images now from the test set. So there's still the, the images that this uh, accuracy was evaluated on, um, but we want to see some of these predictions. So I'm going to create some samples, and that's going to come from sample images. Um, we're going to use dot next to get the next batch. Uh, so if we run this, then samples will be a NumPy array of, uh, actually it's a tuple, a tuple containing two NumPy arrays, the first of which is the uh, input data, the image pixel values, and the second is the labels for each of those images. So we'll get the samples with sample sample images dot next, and then we'll cr we'll generate the predictions from the samples, and then also extract 
uh, the labels. So let's look at this. Model.predict allows us to predict on some samples. So let's predict on sample sub zero. Remember, sub zero will give us the image data. And this gives us probability estimates for each image. So this is returned from the sigmoid activation. And if a given one of these is over 0.5, uh, we can classify as 1, and if it's under 0.5, we classify as 0. So what we can say is to actually ask, use a Boolean uh, array this way, ask if it's greater than 0.5, and we'll get trues and falses. And then what we can do is turn it, uh, we can grab this whole thing and type as type numpy.int, and we'll set it to zeros and ones. Last thing I want to do is squeeze this, numpy.squeeze, uh, to get rid of that extra dimension. So we just have a single vector. So these will be our predictions. So let's call that predictions over here. Uh, and then we also want to get the actual labels. So samples sub 1 gives us the labels um, as floats. So let's just turn it into integers, numpy.int. All right, and we'll grab that and call that labels. All right, so with this, we can do pretty much anything we want. Now, the first thing, uh, I mean, the one thing to note is we want to know what the 0 corresponds to and what the 1 corresponds to. So if we look at test images and type dot class indices, we can get the mapping. And you can see that here, the positive class is actually the negative class. And what I mean is the 1 is referring to the negative, uh, the not having of a mask. So they're flipped. Uh, usually you'd have the positive with mask be 1 and without mask would be 0. Um, so we're going to have to keep that in mind when we're doing this. So we're going to create a new pie plot figure with a figure size of 20 by 20. And I'm going to iterate through uh, for i in range uh, and this should be the square of how, of the, the side of, uh, sorry, I should say, um, this is the total number of images we're creating. So it should be a perfect square because we want to display in a nice uh, square grid. So if we want to display 5 by 5 uh, grid of images, we do 25. Um, so that sounds good. As long as this isn't greater than 32, because 32 is our batch size. So we only have 32 samples. Uh, then plot plt dot subplot. Um, now this will be 5 by 5. So this is the grid. We're doing 5 rows, 5 columns, and indexing with i plus 1. Uh, we do i plus 1 because the subplot function requires that you do 1 indexed, uh, 1 indexing instead of 0 indexing. So it has to start at 1. Uh, then we'll show the image with plt dot uh, im show. And we're going to show the ith image. So if we take sample sub 0, that's going to be the image data. And then take the ith image from that. We'll show the image. Let's turn off the axis. Um, and then if we want to see what this is looking like, type plt.show. And you can see we just have a grid of a bunch of images. Now. Um, I want to display the classifications next to each image, uh, the predictions, and then whether it was correct or not. So we can do this in a sort of cool way. We can just take the title of each plot, of each of these subplots, and we'll make the title no mask if the ith prediction is equal to 1. Uh, because remember, 1 means no mask, 0 means mask. So if the prediction for the ith image is 1, we'll call the, the title no mask, and otherwise we'll call it mask. Um, I misspelled this. So now we should be able to see, yeah, we, so we can see the predictions on each one. However, um, we don't want to leave it up to us to sort of see if it's correct or not, so let's color code them with color equals and then this is going to be, um, we'll make it blue if it's correct and red if it isn't. So blue, if l the ith label is equal to the ith prediction. So if we got them, if we got it correct. 
and otherwise red. All right, and we can now see uh, the prediction on a given image and whether it was right or not based on if it's blue or red. So we misclassified this one. We said, we, we said it had a mask when there isn't, that's why it's red. And then all these are correct. Uh, here we misclassified again, and here we misclassified again. So uh, it's looking pretty good. I mean, we have a 90% accuracy, so that's fairly good, especially with you know, a, a model like this. I mean, it's important, um, definitely important to get a model like this performing well if you were to use it in production, but it's not super crucial. I mean, we could definitely do more optimization to make it better, maybe collect more images, uh, but you know, this this is definitely a good performing model. Uh, so, thank that was some of today's video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content, and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.